All right. And now on to our next recognition. Um, we would like to present our Osborne High School Skills USA participants. Osborne High School participated in the 55th Skills USA Virginia State Championships in Virginia Beach, April 12th through the 13th. The Career and Technical Education students, or CTE students, secured championship titles in aesthetics and crime scene investigation for the second consecutive year. In aesthetics competition, we have um, Carla Juarez Orozco with her model, Jocelyn Reyes. They received um, the gold medal. You all come on down. We also have Angelica um, Farias Barriga, Leonello Morales, and Axel Portillo, who won gold medals in the crime scene investigation team competition. <laughs> Criminal justice student Christian Hernandez earned a gold medal. All of our gold medalists in the aesthetics and criminal justice um, categories will advance to the national competition in Louisville, Kentucky in late June. So congratulations to all of you for that. Additionally, Carlos Moreno and Victoria Peters both won gold medals and Christine Tan and Yarisme Trejo each received a bronze medal in the EMT team competition. Kaylee Reyna won a gold medal, and Jacqueline Orellana Chavez received the silver in the fantasy hair competition. <laughs> and Dania Lopez is the recipient of a bronze medal in barbering. I should also note in cosmetology, Danya also earned a silver medal at the competition. <laughs> Our fabulous students didn't stop there. Five students received medals during technical exams, including Emma Elson, who earned a gold medal in criminal justice. while Chad Matthews received silver, and Jamie Batchelor and Abby Harrelson both won bronze in the category. So we want to congratulate all of you, and then also the CTE staff, including Osborne's criminal justice teacher and Skills USA advisor, Sandra Hine, EMT teacher, Angel Blood, and cosmetology teacher, Arnaz Dotavala. <laughs> Mr. Pop Paul, you're here. Mr. Steiner is here as well. You can come on down. Yeah. He's our supervisor of the CTE program at the school. You come on down too. This is awesome. Congratulations to all of you. You look fabulous. Great job. Yeah, you kind of stagger up there a little bit. I know. I know. Lean, do whatever you got to do. Put your shoulders and individuals in front. We got to get everybody in our Hey, Sandy. Poor dressed ones in the back. Poor dressed ones in the back. Yes, ma'am. Don't worry about it. Okay. I wouldn't make fun of you if it wasn't okay. Actually, I'm going to let Mr. Steiner share one small piece of this with us. Okay, we'd also like to say thank you to the Manassas City Police Department. Yes. Officer Tara Petty is here today. She is uh, one of our Skills USA yes. sponsors with uh, the Criminal Justice Justice <laughs> And then I've seen you, but help me out with your name. <laughs> Officer Rodriguez, that's right. He's, he's there all the time. Great guy. Please come on. Thank you. Let me get a picture and then I'll jump in on the end. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think then we Do we need to move that little table out of the way? Or can they get behind it? Yeah, we can. Yeah. That's right. Miss Williams? Miss Robin? Yes, okay. Now we can see you now. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Every face. Okay. There you go. Right. Okay. I, I think I can have everyone. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. You good? All right. They earn those red jackets. Okay. Really? You want to tell them the story behind the red jackets? Come. The red jackets are the Skills USA uh, jackets. Uh, when you go to nationals or the state competitions, it's, it literally is a sea of red. Skills USA is one of the largest student-run um, organizations uh, uh, in the country. Skills USA starts in your school, then goes on to the local and district level, and then the state, and then the nationals, and there is also the Skills USA World, which is every other year. Um, some of our students uh, competed at the district level, won the gold, and then moved on to the state, won the gold. They're moving to nationals. We cross our fingers. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you for that. <laughs> All right, now we have Ms. Robin Albrecht, the Student Council Association Advisor at Osborne, and she's here tonight to assist me with a special presentation. Thank you. Okay, great to see everybody again. Um, my colleague, Sarah Weaver, um, I can't do this without her. Um, we're a real good yin and yang, so to speak, in terms of getting our programs done. The last time we saw you, we celebrated our Virginia Achievement Award. Well, tonight we are more than happy for the fourth year in a row. I need my, my children. Samantha Denaire, please, and Michelle Rivas, Leon Sunga, and, and Ronald Khan, if you guys will go up there. Um, unfortunately, we don't get big trophies or anything like that. We get little slips of paper. <laughs> but our little slip of paper tells us that we are the 2019 National Gold Council of Excellence. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. and say, well, what the heck does that mean? What did they do? Um, there are two sections to completing this award. The first section is the required, what they call required evidence, and we have to complete 24 tasks that revolve around governance, service, general activities and operations, and student voice. And so that's beyond a piece of paper that might not only be the revision of our constitution and bylaws, but it can also be a major project of some sort. So hypothetically, let's say the CTE walkthroughs that we do in February. After we do those 24 pieces, they then get to do the additional evidence. And the additional evidence is 42 additional projects that they must complete and document. Once we finish that, 
we then have an additional four projects that we must submit into the national database. So what that means is that these young people, not only our student council members, but also the young people who take the leadership class in the SCA lab, are working absolutely nonstop to promote Osborne High School, to create an incredible positive student culture, to develop school spirit, to do community service, and on and on and on. I couldn't be more prouder of them. We lose Leon this year as he goes on to bigger and better things. He's been our president for two years. Um, we are doing our council installation on Thursday night, 7 o'clock, if any of you would like to join us. I know Ms. Seberg will be there and Ms. Kiefer will be there, but we would love to have you. Um, we are changing our protocol on how we do student leadership at Osborne High School. It's really very exciting. Um, Sarah and I are truly looking forward to it, and I believe the students are too. And uh, we look forward to year five on this award. We hope next year. So I think that's it for me. Yes. Congratulations to my kids. You took it up now. So tonight we want to recognize another one of our MCPS family members who has earned an advanced degree. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Leslie Jones. Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones is the K-12 Science Specialist for the School Division. She earned her Doctor of Education degree from Capella University. Her dissertation was on implementing great instruction in collaborative biology classes. So congratulations to you on that advanced degree. Thank you. A lot of hard work. <laughs> Okay, since 1972, National School Nurse Day has been set aside to recognize school nurses for the role they play in the educational setting. This year, School Nurse Day was May 8, 2019. MCPS students and staff showed their love and appreciation for our school nurses last week in many ways. They each take care of our students and staff during the instructional day and are an important part of the MCPS family. Several of our nurses are here tonight. As I call your names, please come forward and please know they do not like to be recognized publicly because they work behind the scenes, but we certainly appreciate everything that they do for us and we want to thank them tonight. So from Baldwin Elementary, Elizabeth Boltz. From Dean Elementary, Leslie Punzi. From Hayden Elementary, Kelly Schletzler. From Round Elementary, Lisa McLaren. From Mayfield Intermediate, Jessica Robinson. From Metz Middle School, Marissa Reagan. From Osborne High School, Sherry Steinler. <laughs> Unfortunately, we could not have Mary Burns here with us tonight. Um, she is at Baldwin Intermediate and also at Osborne High School. 
and Kathy Gray from Weems Elementary could not join us on tonight. But our supervisor of nursing, Suzanne Reniger, is here. <laughs> and as Ms. Reniger comes, if you will allow me a moment to share the state proclamation um, uh, concerning school nurses. Whereas school nurses have served a critical role in improving public health and in ensuring students' academic success for more than 100 years, and whereas school nurses address the home and community factors, social determinants that impact students' health, and whereas school nurses are professional nurses who advance the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievements of all students by serving on the front lines and providing a critical safety net for our nation's most fragile children, and where school nurses act as liaisons to the school community, families, and health care providers on behalf of children's health by promoting wellness and improving health outcomes for our nation's children, and where school nurses understand the link between health and learning and are in a position to make a positive difference for children every day. And whereas the Commonwealth of Virginia and the Department of Education celebrate and acknowledge school nurses everywhere and honor their efforts to deliver care that keeps students healthy and ready to learn. Now, therefore, I, Ralph Northam, do hereby recognize May 8, 2019, as School Nurse Day in our Commonwealth of Virginia, and I call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens. Thank you to all of you for the TLC that you give to our students and staff every day. Congratulations to you all. Thank you, ladies. We appreciate all of you. You all can have your seats. Finally tonight, um, I would like to close by acknowledging our wonderful instructional staff in recognition of Teacher Appreciation Week, which was May 6th through the 10th. We know that qualified and dedicated teachers are critical to the success of our students. Again, all over the division, our parent associations and students honored our teachers for their contribution to the education of the children in the city of Manassas. From special breakfasts and lunches, personalized gifts, words of encouragement, and even free car washes, teachers were told how valuable they are in preparing students for what's next in their lives. Additionally, communities all over the Commonwealth were invited to participate in the fourth annual Thank a Teacher campaign sponsored by the Virginia Lottery by sending thank you notes to teachers. Each thank you note entered the named teacher into a drawing for a chance to win a Virginia themed vacation. Although the various recognitions uh, or recognition weeks may have passed on the calendar, I would like to encourage us all to remember to give an encouraging word throughout the school year. Any time is a good time to let someone know how special they are and that they are appreciated. So congratulations to all of our you know, those that were recognized on tonight, and thank you all for being here to help us celebrate them. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you, Ms. Radford, for doing a wonderful job, as usual, with the presentations and spotlights. Next on the agenda is board committee reports. Are there any board committee reports down this way? Yes, and I'll look to you. Um, Ms. Siebert. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. The Academics Committee met on April 30th to discuss math resource adoption as well as review the results from the staff and citizen survey regarding the 2019-2020 school calendar. These matters come before the full board tonight <coughs> under the discussion and action agendas. Thank you, ma'am. Policy committee reports? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm not the chairman. <laughs> you know, just because she's skipping the meeting. Uh, yeah, we, we met, but we will be uh, discussing that on the discussion agenda. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful, graceful. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Mention of the committee. All right. Next up, board member comments. We'll start with um, 
I'll switch it up tonight. Mr. Al Jadi, whose sister was honored. Any comments, sir? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to congratulate everyone who was recognized tonight, especially my sister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe that it is the middle of May already, which means not very many board meetings left, which is depressing to think about. It really is enjoyable to, to watch all this happen, everyone being recognized, to see what's behind the scenes that I never learned. I learned so much more after becoming a student rep, and I really enjoyed the experience. So thank you to the board for allowing me to be in this position this year. Uh, it's been a, we're now entering the busiest part of the, of the year. We seem to have a test every single week. This week and last week was AP testing. Next week is SOL testing, and the week after that is finals testing. So to keep up with all the events that are going on, I recommend that everyone visits Osborne's website and visit the detailed schedule that we have on the website so that we don't get confused as to what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, next up, Mrs. Williams. Well, I definitely want to say congratulations to all the award winners tonight. I, I just think that's fantastic. We had so many. I can't even go through each individual one. Um, but truly an honor to, to have so many winners and so many things. Um, yes, I understand uh, prom was a success. Uh, they had a huge after prom party uh, at the Freedom Center and apparently it went really, really well. I can't stay up that late, um, so I did not go, but apparently they had a great time. Um, but I'm going to put my plug in here for next year. Every year they always need donations of food, money, or time every year. Um, so if you want to do something to help at some point in time, next year we'll need it again. Um, I would also just like to uh, acknowledge that it was National Police Week this week, and I want to also say thank you to all the SROs out there. They've got a very, very rough job in light of what had happened recently um, to a, just another school incident. Um, so I just want to acknowledge up here publicly that I really appreciate all that they do, and I'm so happy that they're in our school systems uh, keeping our kids safe. And that's all I've got tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, Ms. Seabird. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just again want to say um, thank you to all our teachers out there for um, during Teacher Appreciation Week. It was really fun to see all the activities that were going on. Um, I hope you feel appreciated, and if, you're, if you have a student um, that tells you something enlightening about their day, please share that with a teacher. Maybe share a special moment um, and an encouraging word, like Ms. Radford said. Um, recently, we did interview for new student representatives to the school board, since Mr. Al Jady will be moving on and going to college. Um, we did select two representatives out of the five that were interviewed, and at a future school board meeting, we will be announcing those students. I wanted to remind everyone about the Osborne Choir Feeling Good show, which is being held this Friday and Saturday at 7 p.m. in the Osborne Auditorium. It's $5 for adults and $3 for students. And all funds go to support the Osborne Choral P Department. Uh, I also wanted to thank everyone that responded to the proposed uh, school calendar for 2020-2021. Um, because your input matters, and we really do. We read. Um, each issue that you bring up, and it helps us to make a decision that's right for our students. So thank you for that. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. O'Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, congratulations to everybody honored tonight. Um, it's been a busy few weeks since our last meeting. I hope everybody had a great spring break. Uh, last week I did, for the first time ever, try to get to every school to visit and shake hands with every teacher and every nurse. So if I missed anyone, I just want to you know, from, from me and from the whole board, thank you for everything you do, because uh, you really make a big difference in a lot of lives. I see one life you made a difference in. I'm not sure why he's here. That's my son back there. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> uh, I was fortunate enough also to uh, get back from my trip to go to Beauty and the Beast, and that was an incredible production at Osborne. I just want to, you know, again, thank everyone involved with that. The students were outstanding. I tried to thank all the teachers and staff involved, but they said it was all the students, but I, I really know the staff was heavily involved. Uh, last week we had a GT advisory committee. Had, they have quarterly meetings, and uh, 
so they're getting set to do their annual review of the GT programs in the school. They would like representation from every school, so if, you, if that's something you're interested in, please uh, check the website. They have, uh, like I said, quarterly meetings, not too much time involved. Weems Talents and Gifts had an open house, and that was a great experience seeing all the staff sharing their talents and gifts with the students, and then seeing the students uh, demonstrate those talents and gifts themselves uh, through art and through all different aspects. It's just wonderful. And finally, uh, Ms. Williams mentioned, but I'll mention it again, I want to thank everyone involved with the after prom. That's an incredible endeavor. In particular, the, uh, there are four people who led that up, Jill Spall, Erica Washington, Jackie Scott, and Karen Smith. And this really is a great way to help keep our kids safe on a night when they're out late. Um, I know it's, it's, it's really impressive. And this year was especially good. There were over 220 kids in attendance. So those are 220 kids who might otherwise be doing something else after midnight who were under our protective care until they safely went home. So um, thank you for everyone involved with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Maria. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm not going to repeat anything anybody else said. Um, I'd like to welcome our new principal, Mr. Uh, Flugrath. Uh, unfortunately, he had to get his kids home because um, they have school tomorrow. Um, I hope everybody gives him the support that he's going to need, and I hope he asks for support from us and from everybody in the community. And uh, I have a very good feeling that this is going to be a very successful uh, principalship coming up. Um, spring sports are going on as we speak. Um, I was quite pleased to be able to have this meeting so I couldn't go to any of the games. That's sarcasm. Mm -hmm. um, I can't announce when the next games are because we have to know what the uh, results from tonight are. Keep your eye out because there are going to be boys soccer tomorrow? That was, is girls tonight? No. Girls tonight, boys tonight. Okay. Well, then the boys are tomorrow. You know, you can, you can have a time too if you want. You don't have to interrupt mine. <laughs> Um, so boys soccer is tomorrow, and that should be at home, being the second seed. Okay, um, and um, Mr. O'Hanlon, I've always, you know, been jealous of your hair, but obviously James wants to take after Timmy a little bit. Yeah. It looks good, brother. It looks very good. I'm proud of you. Yeah, it's all me. All right. That's it. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, first, congratulations to all the honorees. Um, we are doing amazing things, and um, I appreciate all the work of the staff and the students. Um, secondly, and I wrote this after I was finished work, um, so hopefully I can read my own writing. Um, Callus, our group at Osborne, they were featured um, in a Spanish language paper. So if you don't understand Spanish, you may not understand it. Um, I can interpret it for you if you like. But uh, anyhow, um, they're doing some amazing things in the community, and I just want to thank them for the work they're doing with our students who are younger than them at Osborne, and also um, for representing us well in the community because they're doing some great stuff. Uh, teacher Appreciation Week, uh, we did a whole lot of things. I know Mayfield, they washed cars. Um, and the gentleman here shook a lot of hands. I appreciate that. And I want to let teachers know that we appreciate them and their work. And the school nurses, um, being the husband of a pediatrician who has to talk to school nurses every single day, um, unless you interact with them, you don't realize what they do. They do so much stuff for our children, um, ranging from dealing with issues at home to issues physical, mental, lots of things that go on with them. So. Um, they are truly, truly, truly angels, and I appreciate the work that they do every day. Um, if I can remember it in here. Third thing, principal search. We had a principal search, and we had, which is kind of unique, um, a central office staff, some of whom are here. Um, we had teachers, we had parents, um, all engaged in the process. And in order to get to the best resolution for any community, I think, you need to have as much input as possible. And based on the process that I saw and the input that I received from those involved, it was a good process. So I thank you all who put your time to doing that from the central office staff to the teachers to um, the parents who, and students who were involved. Um, we appreciate the time and their efforts. It is outside of the purview of what they do every day. Um, and they're doing this to help us get the best person. And I congratulate Mr. Flugrath for, um, for being a great candidate and look forward to work with him going forward. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, I just wrote phenomenal. They did a, a great job with that performance. Uh, there was a tea party that I got to judge uh, some of the costumes before him, which was pretty cool. Uh, but the staff, the fine arts, Department, the drama department, the orchestra, 
the parents. And I'll single out Mr. Gabalski, the principal of Osborne, because I watched him um, playing uh, the piano during the performance. And he was so into it and so supportive. And it's awesome to have that kind of support from an administrator. So I thank all the folks and the students who did a wonderful job. They really did a great job. And some of them were nominated for CAPIs, which are the CAPI Awards and Awards in the DMV, so to speak, uh, where students who act in performances and are in the background as well get nominated. And they have a big performance at the Kennedy Center, and they get honored. And some of our students were nominated for that. Uh, so I look forward to being there and seeing um, those who bring home even more, more trophies. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit Brown, Hayton, Dean, Osborne, and Metz in the last week and a half. Uh, some amazing things going on. Dr. Newman and I were at a couple of schools today. We had SOLs, and we were told to be very quiet, so we had to walk quietly through the halls. Uh, but our children are trying their hardest. Our staff is trying their hardest. Um, one teacher at Round, I believe, she wrote a letter to each parent and ha had the parents write letters to the students to encourage them for their SOL test this morning, which was a great idea. And our teachers, as another example, go far above and beyond the call of duty. And that made such a difference to the kids when they're about to take an important test to have a letter, a surprise letter from their um, parent or guardian, whoever was at home with them. Uh, and if they didn't have a parent or guardian, then the principal wrote them a letter. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, I got the opportunity to speak to Ms. Stevens' class at Round, which was fun, which I've been doing a lot this year. I also visited Ms. Boaz and Ms. Tierney at Dean and talked to their class. I ended up being there for over an hour. Um, and then after I finished, some of the kids saw that I had a UVA National Championship basketball hat on, which I wear, like, wear every day. I'm worth a bit. No, not really. But, uh, <laughs> but hey, I'm going to glory in this for forever. But anyhow, so when the kids saw the basketball hat, they asked me to come play basketball with them during recess. So I took my suit jacket off, and I ran up and down outside the court in my shoes and my, you know. I didn't, I didn't block anybody's shot. It was pretty nice. Um, but just being out there with the kids and seeing the joy they had during recess was pretty cool. So I thanked them for letting me uh, participate. And one student in particular, I wrote her name down, Jasmine Valenzuela Ramey. She took notes um, because during the hour I was there, the students had ideas of things we should do. And I think I have it in here somewhere. Yeah. First of all, she writes neater than I did. But she took notes and wrote down what the class set of suggestions that we should do in the Manassas City School System and at Jenny Dean, which I'll share with you all for retreat. Um, but our kids are so smart and um, so compassionate, so it was just great to spend time with them. So I thank them for letting me hang out with them and play basketball with them. And I didn't pull anything or anything, so I'm, I'm good. Um, and with that, um, I will end and move on to the next item on the agenda, citizens' comments. Are there any citizens' comments? Going once, going twice. James, you don't want to say anything about your dad? And, you know. OK, great. Okay, <laughs> good. Good comment. All right, uh, next on the agenda, uh, consent agenda. May I have a motion? Uh, sir, I move that the school board of the city of Manassas approve the consent agenda as modified. Second. Motion by Mr. Demaria, second by Mrs. Williams, that the school board of the city of Manassas approve the consent agenda as modified. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it 5-0. Next up, discussion agenda. And the first item is student achievement, K-12 mathematic resource. And I believe Dr. Kremp is going to make the presentation. Good evening, Chairman Williams, members of the school board, and Dr. Newman. Thank you so much for having me here this evening to speak with you and our community about the math resource adoption process that we've been in for about the last year. And we've finally drawn some conclusions in that process, and we are here this evening to share this with you. I just do want to reiterate to everyone that we followed board policy and board regulation as we went through this process. And while I'm certainly starting, I'm actually going to turn it over to Mr. Ray Singletary. He is our pre-K to 12 math specialist. And while I direct and support um, the process all along, Mr. Singletary has his hands in it day in and day out. And so um, he took great ownership and pride and spent a lot of time working with our teachers to ensure we made good selections for our students. And so I'm going to turn it over to him so he can share with you uh, about our experience and all of our recommendations. So Mr. Singletary. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to share our process with you today. Um, it's definitely been a roller coaster ride and definitely enjoyable for me to, to work through the process. And I'm ready to share what we have today. So um, I'm going to just take you through kind of some buckets of information. So first of all, I'll just acknowledge some folks that were involved. Then I'll talk a little bit about our vision um, and how it connects to what we're moving forward with 
as far as our resources. And then we'll talk a little bit about the process. Next, we'll talk about the cost and then kind of summarize everything at the end. So this was the leadership team that was involved. It includes myself and the coaches from each one of the, the schools, the intermediate and elementary schools. This was the committee, and these were the pre-K-4 teachers, but I, I just want to acknowledge um, Janet Graham and the principals from last year for helping us start this process um, in June. They got some teachers together and, and got some great volunteers and some great committee members to help us make a great decision. Um, so this was the pre-K-4 team. Then 5-8, which consists of the intermediate and the middle school, METS. And then 912 was our credit bearing crosses, so Algebra 1 and above. And that included some Mets and Osborne teachers. Also, we had um, some of our technology team at Central Office look through the resources just to make sure everything was compatible when we look at our digital resources. So they did a nice job of giving us some feedback around those items. And I also, like I said, want to thank Dr. Cramp and our team at Central Office for helping to guide me through the process. It was, it was very, it flowed very well just because of their knowledge and their wisdom uh, in supporting us. All right, so to talk a little bit about the vision, um, I'm just going to hit some buckets here. So for Manassas City, we're talking about maximizing student potential for our instructional we look at dynamic instruction to maximize. And then for mathematics, I know for me, I want to see us build a community of active math learners. Math is sometimes seen as passive, like you're just getting information from the teacher and then you have to regurgitate it back. But I want the students to be more engaged in the process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how. So this is our instructional focus. We're, and this is research-based. We, we look at two priorities in mathematics. Um, increasing student creativity, so bringing their ideas to the table. Increasing student discourse, so talking about their ideas with each other. And we believe that leads to increase in student achievement. So our strategies are mathematics workshop, which is our framework for instruction, student-centered learning. And then one of those components is number talks. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that just to give you a little context. So usually in a math class, you have 18 times 5 and they, you get the answer and you're done. You move on to the next thing. Um, but with what we're talking about, you ask the question a little bit differently. You say, how many different ways can you multiply 18 times 5? And now, instead of just looking for one answer and one pathway, students are looking for multiple pathways. And that gives them an avenue to discussion. So if I'm advanced, I get more. If, if, I've, if I'm lower, then I get to hear different options of how to attack the problem. So, We've been doing professional development in this item. This year, we've done number talks K-8 and math workshops for, for grades 3, 5, 7, and Algebra 1. Next year, we're looking at K-12 number talks, math workshop for grades 4, 6, 8, and geometry. And then in 2020, 21, we're looking at K-12 number talks, continuing that work, and then um, math workshop for K through 2 and Algebra 2. So now I'm going to take you through our process of kind of selecting our, our resources. So these were, this was our meeting schedule. And these dates varied based on the grade levels. And every, every grade level had the same number of meetings. Um, for our evaluation to choose a rubric, that was our first task. And what we used was we used the state rubric. And we also used some neighboring divisions, their rubric and kind of combine things to come up with these components and these categories. These were the vendors or the companies that we looked at. And again, Janet Grant did a great job of, of helping set this up. It was all in the room, all organized, labeled. I just kind of had to walk in and say, here, this is what we're doing. So it was great. Um, so as we got to the resources and started our review process, we did two levels. We did a first round, which was the basic needs, just connecting to our content standards, making sure things were good there. If, if the resource passed by getting a score of six, it made it to the second round for a deeper dive into those resources and aligned to our goals and the vision that we talked about. <clears throat> so as we 
kind of narrowed it down after you looked at that long list. We narrowed it down to three to five and asked some of those folks to come in for a Q&A session. Not everybody had the opportunity to come in because we didn't need to ask some of the vendors some questions. So it was most, these were the, these were the ones that we asked to come in for further digging into their resource. So to finalize, we, after the, the discussions, we, we had each person rank them from one to four. Then we kind of narrowed it down a little bit more, looked at the pros and cons, and did a final vote. And the final vote, everybody was on the same page with the resources that we selected. So here's some examples. This is the first example of grades two to four. This is what the teacher feedback was for Orgo. And then this is for McGraw-Hill. This is for Algebra I, Geometry, and Algebra II. And this was the teacher feedback there. So our final choices, I'm kind of compress it for you. So K through six was Orgo. And there it was a little bit of deviation for grades two to four. They wanted an additional resource to support in their planning. So the Heinemann resource is something they can help with misconceptions in mathematics and help them to plan a little bit better. So they wanted to add that resource. Seven, eight, it was Go Math. For Algebra One, Geometry, and Algebra Two, it was McGraw-Hill. And then for the upper level courses, we had Pearson for Stats and Probability, Larson for Calculus, and BFW Freeman for AP Statistics. And throughout the process, we made sure to inform the teachers in the schools that weren't involved, made sure they, they knew about what was going on, and then made sure to present our final um, decisions to them as well. So the last phase was kind of the community feedback, and we tried to do this in multiple ways. Um, the first way was to take it to school events and have them placed out at school events. So if there was a STEM night, there was a STEM night at Dean. So we had it placed out there so parents get an opportunity to view the resources there. Um, and we try to do that at every school. But we also had them at central office. So for two weeks for parents to, or the community members to come and review. So we had approximately 10 people give us some to review the documents. But we had two specific ones that gave us feedback. One at the secondary level was about the readability in the document. So for ESOL and SPED students, it seemed a little busy and they had some questions around that. And an answer to that that we, we posed was the teachers at that level wanted a resource that they could adapt or edit so they can make changes so that students can have more space and see the, the problems that they need in a clear way. And then the second one was about um, the use of usefulness of textbooks at the K-6 level. And um, so we addressed that by saying, you know, at that level, those aren't necessarily workbook textbooks, they're, they're workbooks. So students can write in them and use them in the classroom so teachers don't have to make copies. And the teachers at that level did want those books. So now I'm going to go into a little bit about the costs. And I'm going to start with the student, tell you what the student might get, then the teacher, and then the overall cost, and then um, additional costs for the next few years. So for Orgo, the students get workbooks, so all of them get workbooks. Teachers get dig digital resources, so they get resources no matter what grade they teach. They get, if they teach third grade, they get K to six. They get all of the resources at every grade level. Um, and then our cost for that was $314,325 um, with an annual cost uh, for the workbooks each year, approximately $85,345. And then any additional cost over the seven years would be for enrollment growth. For Heinemann, this was the resource that the teachers at the 2-4 level wanted for support. Um, the reason why there's a difference in the numbers is the 2-4 wanted it for their planning, and then we got it for the coaches to support all grade levels, the math coaches. So the cost for that one is $3,873 for that, and there's no additional cost over the next seven years. 
for grade seven, eight, let's go math. Again, every student will get a digital access. And then we also purchased some books for students that might need those books, just a few. Um, all teachers get digital access. And then the cost for this one is $110,424 with, in this case, no additional cost over the next seven years for the workbooks and then only additional cost for enrollment growth. Next is McGraw-Hill and again every student gets digital access. We bought some textbooks for um, students that might need them and then every teacher gets digital access. The cost of this is $141,684 and then the, over the next seven years, it's just replacement and enrollment growth. For the upper levels, for statistics and probability, again, every student gets digital access, every teacher gets digital access. We bought a couple of books for students that might need it. And then the, the cost for this one is $16,132. And this one is a six year contract, so replacement and en enrollment for that, but we'll also need to, to put aside some money for an additional digital cost for that seventh year. For calculus, again, Larson, that one did not have any digital resources. Those are just textbooks. Um, so we got 30 of those, and then the cost of that is $4,917. And that, over the next seven years, is for replacement and enrollment growth, any additional costs. Oops. Next, we have um, BFW Freeman, that's AP st Statistics, and that one, every student gets digital, and we <coughs> bought some books for support of students that might need it, and then every teacher gets digital access. The cost of that one is $5,575. And then over the next seven years, just replacement and enrollment growth, additional costs. So the total cost for the math resource adoption would be $596,930. And we do have sufficient funds to cover that cost. So the next steps in the process, we present it to the academic committee on April the 30th. I'm presenting to you tonight. And then on the 28th, we have our final vote for the resource adoption. So again, I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight, and I appreciate your time, and thank you for, it's been an enjoyable process, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. I'm going to ask the board if they have any comments, and I'll start with the Academic Committee Chair, Ms. Seberg. Yeah, um, Ray, or Mr. Singletary, could you please um, explain again about the online digital resources and how the teachers can manipulate what, and how they might be able to use that? Yes, so for Orgo, the digital resources are, like if I'm a third grade teacher, I get access to kindergarten to sixth grade. So if a student is not at that grade level and may need some additional support, then a teacher has access to a first grade level, some of the first grade level material. Also, if a student's already at the fifth grade level, but they're in the third grade on certain topics, a teacher has access to that. So it gives them more flexibility to differentiate in their classroom to maximize the student potential. And I feel like um, we addressed, we didn't, we never get very many comments about this, um, but I'm glad that we start with the teachers to get their input because they know what, how they need to teach this. They know best how they need to teach this. So mm -hmm. um, thank you to you and thank you to the committee for coming up with all this information and all the work that goes through um, developing these solutions, so. Thank you. Yes, I just would. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, um, I just wanted to thank you for your. Pro this was your first process with us, and you presented it to the academic committee already, and um, so it was very insightful and a very intense process. So I really do thank you for that, and I also wanted to point out, as well to the board, um, that five hundred ninety-six thousand nine hundred thirty dollars. Um, is within the budget we had approved already, so we had discussed that during the committee as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I'm sorry I didn't make the uh, <laughs> meeting, um, so I always have questions. Just one this time, and I ask this of all subject matter. Where you've picked different vendors throughout the years, does the material transition seamlessly from one grade, from one vendor to another? In other words, it, I think it, it's okay to use different vendors. Yes, for different I think age that's, groups. That's, uh, that's my responsibility, and that's our responsibility as a, as a team to make sure that it, it aligns across, not just within the grade level. So yes, we're, we're building the curriculum to make sure that it aligns and, and making sure the vendors come in so teachers get access early and can see what the materials are and then make sure it aligns to everything. So we had those discussions, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I have one question. Um, so I'm, I'm a former math teacher years and years and years ago. Um, and I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll um, ask you because I know I'll, I'll get the question. Um, at the younger grades, there's a workbook for every student Given that we use digital resources and a lot of work on the computer, why do students need individual workbooks? Well, at that, at that level, it's, the teachers felt like it was, it was nice for them to have that resource so that they can write the stuff in there and not have to try to print something off or get something from somewhere else. So it's right accessible in the, in the, in the classroom. But the other component, especially at the early, early grades, is that um, it helps with fine motor skills, just being able to manipulate a book. and um, for me, it, it helps them learn numbers and context, so they have to flip through the book and see what, what page five is, what page six is. So it's definitely more benefits than just the content. It's, it's a little bit beyond that. All right. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Well, thank you for the work you've done, and thanks to the academic committee, too, for all the work they did and um, the input they gave. So, Thank you. Good job. Next on the agenda, um, finance and operations, the energy performance contract. Um, we'll start off with Mr. Hawkins. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, approximately a year ago, the school board authorized a major upgrade to our school building, building's infrastructure. These upgrades were completed through the use of an energy performance contract. This contract guarantees that MCPS will save enough money to fully fund these projects over a 15-year period. Tonight, we have with us Mr. John Poggi, Ms. Katrina Tatum, and Mrs. Bridget Nelson from Johnson Controls. They were the, uh, the vendor that we have the performance contract through to give us an update of the improvements made and the savings realized today. So I'll let them have it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good evening, um, Dr. Newman, Mr. Chairman, President, um, members of the board, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, as Mr. Hawkins said, my name is John Poggi. I'm on the business side of things, just from an introduction standpoint. I'm more the account executive uh, for Johnson Controls. Uh, with me, I have two of our, we call them measurement verification engineers. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Bridget Norton. I'm the main measurement and verification engineer for this project. So I'll be presenting to you over the next 15 years, <laughs> potentially. Um, but <laughs> Katrina Tatum has been working on the installation report um, as I was out for a few months for maternity leave recently. So she's been working here and would like to present our results so far. Good evening. I'd like to apologize for uh, misspelling measurement. Got that out the way. <laughs> uh, this is, we're going through to show you the savings for the installation period. So it was about a year ago that um, we signed an agreement on February 16, 2018. And around a year ago, we actually started the installation. The installation on these particular ECMs that you see on the side. And tonight, we're going to go through each of those and kind of discuss the savings from the date of their completion. As a summary of the benefits, the measured, the, the FEMS, which are uh, facility improvement measures, you'll hear me say that word, that were um, saved is 141641 that means that we did a pre and post measurement to verify that we're going to save what we say we're going to save. The next is the non-measured, which is the building envelope. From its completion date, we saved 7,160. 
That means that we did calculations that were agreed upon between the city and JCI, and if everything was installed as it was supposed to, which it was, met the scope, then that's what we saved, and that's how we. The last is uh, operation and maintenance costs. It's mostly the lighting and water material savings from not having to rebuy light bulbs and other materials for water. So total, just for this period, which is the installation period, we saved 164470 In the contract, we guaranteed that we would save at least 81497 during the installation period. Um, so we are over currently by 82000 The first film I would like to discuss is the lighting upgrades and occupancy sensors. The completion date is the date that each of these buildings were completed. And then this is the amount of electricity that we saved, the KWH and the KW. And the completion date through April 30th. So I'll go through your guarantee um, for year one started on May 1st. So all of this is a savings through April 30th. And we saved 101,210. And below you'll see the installation benefits of 12,702. Next, we did the water upgrades. That was completed back in June. And what we did there is retrofitted the tank tops and the flush valves and the low flow, the aerators and various sinks. That saved in gallons, it saved 1,975. For your heating, when it comes to sinks in particular, approximately 40% of that is hot water. That's how you saved a lot of your heating. So when you're using a kitchen or taking a shower, approximately that 40% of that is hot water. So you saved 1,165 1, in natural gas therms totaling a savings of 23297 with installation benefits of 2966 The building envelope improvements. I have at the bottom a picture of uh, door sweeps. <coughs> so this is going through and sealing up your building. Um, anything that loses a lot of infiltration, which is your conditioned air, and just by sealing it up, we saved, uh, you save on your electricity, and you save on your therms. Your electricity is your cooling and your therms is your heating. So by not releasing that condi conditioned air uh, or not having to con constantly reheat it, that's how much you saved. And it was completed the latter part of October, saving around 7160 for this particular period. The building automation system, the BAS. What we did here is we either replaced or recommissioned. Recommissioned meaning that we went through and checked to make sure that it is operating as it was installed to operate. Uh, and we did it at these four schools. We did not realize savings for this particular period because this particular film was completed after the fact. Again, they all were completed, uh, signed off final in April, so some of them were still going on. But just by having a building automation system, I put in a slide that of the benefits of being able to easily uh, troubleshoot problems, look at what your thermostats are, you know, the settings are in various rooms, and just working smarter by having everything in a centralized location to look. Next, we did the install the boiler combustion controls. That was done at Osborne and Metz. And again, we did not claim servings for this because it was completed after the heating season. So during that, what that does is it just balances your fuel so that you're not constantly overheating and it balances to the actual demand. And by not cycling the boiler as much, you're gonna save energy because it's not constantly heating. Next, we've replaced uh, a lot of your air handlers at both Osborne and Metz. Many of them were uh, there with the building, <coughs> the same as when the building was built, I want to say in the 80s. And this was completed in February. And just by having those few months, um, we've saved $3,558. 
I also noted that we put in a VFD drive, which is up there in the corner on each of these units, which simply reduces the amount of fan power needed. Um, it goes against towards the load, so you don't have to do 100% if you only have a few occupants, but not as much cooling. Bipolar ionization. This is probably one of the last films that was completed before we could sign off the project. So again, this was not included in the savings for the installation period. And what this does is there's a requirement of so much fresh air, outside air for everyone in all the buildings. That is to reduce the amount of particulates in the air. By installing a bipolar ionization, you can reduce that amount of outside air, which means you don't have to condition that air, meaning you don't have to heat and cool that air that's coming into the space. So by reducing that amount of air, you come up with additional savings. And you'll see one of those little devices on each of the air handlers in Osborne, Mayfield, and Baldwin. Lastly, the environmental impact. And it just so happened that this morning when I got up, you know, y'all, many of us look at our phones, and it just mentioned how the CO2 is at its highest in three million years. Um, so doing projects like this is extremely important. We reduced um, in tons uh, 794 in electricity and just six in natural gas therms, but that's equal to 138 homes of electricity per year, what it takes. Um, it's equal to 1.01 million number of smartphones being charged, uh, 89,000 gallons of gasoline being consumed, 1.9 million miles by an average passenger vehicle, and that's just in this short installation period of how much CO2 we reduce. Uh, 34,628 trash bags of waste. And um, going from incandescent lamps switched to LEDs, 30,145 is equal to 30,145 incandescent lamps being switched to LEDs. And at the bottom is where we get this information from. It's a calculator that is the link to it. Lastly, are there any questions? Thank you for the presentation. And I'll look to my right. Any questions or comments? Mr. DeMario. Yes, sir. A um, couple things on like the bipolar and the some other things. Um, I'm sure we've been told this, but that doesn't mean I remember this. Um, why did we only do three of our buildings? Payback, savings. So in order, oh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, you know, this whole project when it first started, they looked at all of our schools and they tried to determine what would be, um, what could we have savings that we would have an appropriate payback period within the period of the contract, which was 15 years. And so that's how those schools were. Yeah, the schools it was didn't not fit. because the schools didn't need it, it was because of the payback period uh, was within the, within the contract period. Okay. Um, then there's, bear with me, the water upgrades. Um, I know we've tested in the past and we've been very successful at our testing. Um, does this help with our um, lead in the, in the, the, a problem we didn't have? Um, no, um, another, I mean, this just helps us save water. It doesn't help, it doesn't clean up the water. Uh, ch changing these uh, upgrades? Uh, it's just lessening the amount of water. It was a bit better, smarter use of the water that we have. Okay. Uh, we, we have a full array of testing on our, on our water, and, um, and we are in full compliance with all rules and regulations and laws. And, and I know we were in compliance we before in the water. I don't want to all of this. Anybody down that route. That's why I didn't want to mention it, but I had to. <laughs> but in the past, we have been proactive on this long before all of this hit the hit the, the news we were well ahead of that and we were protected long you know, before we went that. through two cycles of, uh, of testing of water and we worked in cooperation with the health department and the city uh, uh, water department and um, like i said we are in full compliance we 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 actually have uh, none there's you can't make if there's any lead in our water it won't be it can't be measured it's, that's how low it is 
we've had a couple uh, water fountains in the past that were they barely hit them in were within the allowable range but we didn't take any chances we and that was years place. ago as well and that was years ago too that, right. that we, we had all of those I'm sorry things. I brought up lead I'm sorry oh, Andy okay. no but it, it I, I knew that we were in good shape the good thing is that I wrote down iron here to talk about it and as I was talking I realized wrong mineral here or wrong, wrong metal um, and Dean where where are we on Dean so as you know, we we excluded Dean throughout much of this process mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the plan to replace uh, Dean um, shortly. With it was, it was thought that Dean wouldn't be there by the time this contract um, was completed. So we're going back. We did have JCI when they first came out do an evaluation of Dean as well. So we're going back looking at their recommendations uh, right now and determining which ones, uh, if not all of them, that we're going to incorporate with the money that the uh, school board has adopted in the CIP for enhancements of the school. But this summer, we will have uh, lighting upgrades for sure, but we do need um, other things done to the school. So I, I know that the lighting will be replaced, but we also need to be, go back and look at JCI's report for things that may not have fallen, uh, may not have had an adequate payback period, but things that might need to be done in light of the idea that Dean now is being pushed back at least till 2026. At least. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Andy. Ms. Williams? No, Mr. DeMario answered my question about I was curious what was going to happen to Dean now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hammond? Thank you. Okay. And I'm, I'm, thank you all for the presentation. I do have one question. Um, you noted the savings we had. Can you kind of just discuss, um, there also is a cost of implementation for the equipment that's put in. So how do the savings reflect how much money is saved when you incorporate the cost as well? So. So the, the total cost of the program was approximately $7.1 million, right? And so we, uh, JCI has guaranteed us that our, our, the amount of money that we have to pay back is approximately 400000 roughly $400,000 a year for the next 15 years. They've guaranteed that we're going to save uh, that amount of money, if not more, during that period of time to make the payment back in full. So this was a... Uh, an extensive upgrade to our infrastructure without actually costing the school board any additional money in budgeted funds. So we're very excited about it. Just in this short time period, you saw all of the environmental impacts that we have made to this community. Just imagine next year when we're here, when we report back to you, these numbers will be at least four times higher than what they are right now. I mean, all of these savings and all of these environmental impacts just happened in a short period of time, from the time they had it installed, and they've been working feverishly for, for a year. So once this, now that all of this is done, and we have a full year's worth of impact, uh, you're going to see uh, quite a bit of difference. A lot of these improvements have been made that will last um, long past the 15-year contract period, will, especially like those air handling units and some of those other things that have a useful life of in excess of 20 years, 25 years. Okay. Now, question. I have, uh, that's a follow on. Um, change is dynamic, so things happen quickly. So let's say in two years there's some huge change in light fixtures, which uh, has a more efficient technology. It could save us more money. Would we be able to use that, or are we pretty much going well, to stay with, we're we with this uh, with, with this energy contract that we have right now? That okay. doesn't mean to say that we can't go back out and do it again. There's no rule that we can't mm -hmm. have multiple um, efforts at, at this. Uh, so. If there is something, if it makes financial sense, and, and then we, we then we will entertain that again. Okay. So. Right. Yes, jump in. We have uh, multiple phases like that with other school districts. Okay. Like the, the Commonwealth, okay. Where maybe they're six, seven, ten years into it, and mm -hmm. you want to relook at upgrades again. So right. It does make sense, that, depending on the situation. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, well, thank you all very much for your presentation and for saving us money. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, FY 2019-2020 student fees and charges. Uh, Mr. Hawkins. So I'm just giving Mrs. Garza to pull up um, these charges. There's really no changes in the, in the fee schedule uh, from this year uh, to next year. Um, the only, change, the only change that we have, there are no changes in lunch prices, there are no changes in any other fees or rentals for buildings. 
The only change that we have is in the charge for adult lunches at our schools. Um, they, they, they will be increased there. That's one. Can you make this bigger, Alva, please, if you can? That is, um, so you can see the adult lunches went up from uh, $3.25 to $3.35, or if you had the, what they call the premium lunch from three eighty five dollars to three ninety five. dollars And that was, uh, that change was dictated to us by uh, the federal government, USDA, uh, because we cannot have um, reimbursements from free and reduced lunch program to be uh, helping subsidize um, adult lunches. So therefore, we, we were required to move that up. That was not a voluntary change on our part. So um, I don't know if you want to go through each one of the uh, sheets that we have, but we don't have any, there, were, there are no changes in building rental fees or lunch prices or anything from, um, from the current year to, to next year. Okay. Board members, any questions or comments? No, no sir, no changes, no questions. No. Okay. You're good to go then, Mr. Hawkins. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, Mr. Tim DeMaria, school board policy committee member, will present the following policies. Yeah, member. <laughs> okay, we're going to go through every one of these. Um, no, we're not. <laughs> uh, we had a, our policy meeting a couple weeks ago, week and a half ago, and we went through every one of these. And uh, some minor changes, the vast majority of the changes were just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Grammatical. It's what you got a teacher in the audience for. Um, the only one, and if anybody's got any questions about it, uh, we can talk about it. The only one that I have a, I would like to uh, highlight is KI, is it? KI, the uh, uh, political campaigning and materials. Um, at our last election, we had an issue with folks coming out and putting up their campaign signs while we still had buses in the bus loops. Um, for the lifetime of our city, we never had the problem. People played by the rules. People knew that you waited till about 6 o'clock until all the kids were gone before you started doing that. But now folks have decided to try and jump the gun and get the better spaces and start putting them out at 3 o'clock. So now we have to create a policy for that, which is, um, in my estimation, a little bit sad. So I, I'm looking at that policy right now, and um, the only thing I see an issue with that we um, didn't discuss completely in the, in the meeting was that um, it says since six, school, since six school board buildings are used as polling stations, political signs, may be placed at the school board properties from 7 p.m. the day before the scheduled primary or election until 8 p.m. of the day of the primary election. I think that should say until 8 p.m. of the day after the primary or election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am, am I right there, Andy? Yeah. 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 So they're not there the next school day? Yeah. No, 8 p.m. of the day of the election. Of the, okay, that's, yeah. that, you're right, all right. And then the next sentence is the one that I've got a question with. The next sentence says, on a primary election day, by 9 p.m., all signs must be removed from school board property. That's sort of um, not redundant, but changing the sentence before that. What does it say after that? It says some, some uh, And all community. building grounds fully restored to pre-primary election conditions so that the normal operation of these facilities can Commence. Right, so but I'm trying I, to. I'm trying. When we wrote that, we're trying to say, okay, your signs can stay up to till eight o'clock. Right. right. But we want everything taken down, everything back to normal by nine o'clock, so that we can start school or start the normal functions of the building can start the next day. Why don't we just say eight o'clock? We could. The okay. same as the signs, because um, I've been at elections now for uh, dozens of elections. And the polling places close at 7, and most of us are gone by 7.03, and everything's out of there. 8 o'clock, in my estimation, gives plenty of time for us to get everything up and out and hopefully um, return 
uh, the condition to normal operating of these. I was trying to give some leeway, some more, because I think when, the, when, you, when we have the local elections, their turnout may not be as high as when they have when they have presidential elections. And I think when the last presidential election that we had, they, it was, it was after 8 o'clock before they got all the votes certified and sent in. Certified, but, but everybody was through before that. Oh, everybody was yeah. through before that. I mean, That's we, we, we get out of there, to, uh, literally the latest I've ever been there is 730. Okay. Um, and that's, and, and you know at 630 or 645, everybody's picking up signs because they want to get the he heck out of there too. Um, okay. I, I, I would just rather put 8 o'clock there and be consistent that everything's gone at 8. We'll change it. Is everybody okay with that? I'm okay with that. Okay. Um, any other questions on the policies that we went through? Um, most of us were there because Robin showed up too. Because yeah. I, I worry about her. No need to stay, go to a policy meeting and Robin shows up and I got to get her that girl a life. Um, and so that's my full report, sir. Okay. Well, thanks from the future policy committee chair. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Action agenda, new business. Uh, thank you very much again. A revision to the approved school board regular business meeting calendar. Uh, who's handling that? You want a motion? Um, oh. Would you change the date? Oh, yeah. Moving the July meeting from July 16th to July 23rd. Okay. So Sir, I move that the school board of the city of Manassas waive second reading and approve <coughs> changing the July 16, 2019 regular business meeting to July 23, 2019. Second. Motion by Mr. Demaria, second by Mrs. Seberg, that the school board of the city of Manassas waive second reading and approve changing the July 16th, 2019 regular business meeting to July 23rd, 2019. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? All Aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it, 5-0. All right, next item, old business, revision to the approved school board regular business meeting calendar. Mr. Chair, I move that the school board of the city of Manassas approve changing the June 11, 2019 regular business meeting to a special meeting to accommodate Osborne High School's graduation and to consider candidates for locally verified credits. Second. I have discussion. Mm -hmm. Motion by Ms. Uh, Seabrex and Mr. O'Hanlon uh, that during the, um, yeah, oh, um, I'm looking at the, during the, uh, all right. Uh, the school Board of City Manhattan has approved changing the July 11, 2019 regular business meeting to a special meeting to accommodate Osborne High School's graduation to consider candidates for locally verified credits. Is there any discussion? Yeah, Ms. that was Demary. June 11, yeah. not July. Yeah. Um, and says, yeah, we don't. July. It, it, it mean to have a special meeting at graduation? Right, because I, I guess this year, because the graduation was moved to Tuesday, usually we have the meeting the day after, but the meeting that we initially picked was on, was on graduation night. Right, but we don't normally have to. Well, sometimes we do have a meeting beforehand to, to improve. For, we've done it before. Yeah, but we quit doing that. We've, we've given authority to, have we not given authority for you guys to locally verify credits? And is, is it on? For some, we didn't have to do this any longer. Yes, the high school has a committee uh, that approves right. the ver verified credits. The only ones who come to the board is if there's an appeal, mm -hmm. such as they deny it, and, mm -hmm. and then a the parent wants to appeal it to mm -hmm. you. Okay. So it gives you All right. The option. We just haven't done it for right. five, six years now. Okay. 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 All right. I, I mean, we'll be there. When yeah. We right. And I, th I think the genesis of it was that in case some emergency came up and we had to do something, we could do it because we've already made the provision for as opposed to having to okay so our, our the meeting on june 11th is going to remain it's just gonna be a special no meeting. because it's graduation night but it's just, doesn't it's it say it's gonna, be a it's gonna be a special meeting right. at uh george mason right is that right yes okay okay it, it, it just seems to me all we're doing is changing the location okay Okay, I'm good. I will vote yay. All right. <laughs> Motion by Ms. Seberg, St. Mr. O'Hanlon, that School Board of the City of Manassas approved changing the June 11th, 2019 regular business meeting to a special meeting to accommodate Osborne High School's graduation and to consider candidates for locally verified credits. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it, 5-0. Next up, student achievement. Revised proposal to the 2020-2021 school calendar. Mr. Lyon. Good evening, Chairman Williams, members of the board, Dr. Newman. Uh, this evening, I'm here to present uh, the, the results of our survey um, 
from when we proposed uh, the calendar back on March 26. Uh, right before we presented on March 26, the governor signed a new bill into law that allowed school systems across Virginia to start before Labor Day. Uh, they did include a limit to 14 days before Labor Day. However, they provide an exemption to school systems who were operating under the good clause exemption for 1819, which Manassas City was operating under. So we are exempt from that limit. We can start more than 14 days before Labor Day. Uh, as part of that new law, it also requires <coughs> excuse me, school divisions to be closed from the Friday immediately preceding Labor Day through Labor Day itself. And that is reflected in, in the proposed calendar. To give you a summary of the development uh, for this calendar, uh, we surveyed staff twice. The first survey was used to develop the proposed uh, draft of the calendar by the academic committee. We had 435 staff members uh, respond to that survey. Uh, a second survey was sent out to staff and to the commu community uh, between uh, March 27th through April 10th. Uh, we had 310 staff respond. And for the community, we provided an English and Spanish version. We sent out 4,300, roughly 4,300 emails, delivered about 4,000. Of those 4,000 that were uh, open, 30, 388 people responded. Uh, we also posted a shareable link on the website, and we had 47 responses through that. The academic committee met on August, uh, March 6th after the first staff survey to uh, prepare that proposed draft, uh, and then met on, uh, uh, then we proposed a draft on March 26th, and then met again on April 30th to review the, re the results of the second surveys. The second survey results um, from staff show that overall 72% 72, 72 of staff approved of the proposed calendar for 2020-2021. Uh, you can see their teachers were roughly 72%, and it breaks out across the different groups there, school support, school administrators, and central office. Total responses were 310. Of those 310 responses, we had 127 comments. Uh, applying the theme analysis to that, uh, you'll see three columns. Uh, our top um, themes are, are, are stated here. The first column shows the percentage of, of comments that that theme uh, is weighted for. So about 13% of all comments dealt with professional development days and teacher work days, and those dealt around uh, some feelings about professional development days versus teacher work days, and, and then how many we have at the front of the calendar. And we addressed that in this presentation in a few slides. Uh, another theme that was common across both people who approved and didn't approve was the spring break, the Monday after. It was not included on the proposed draft, uh, and we have more to say about that in a slide or two. Uh, another theme that was um, prevailing through here was, you know, obviously people who didn't approve of the calendar mainly it was about the later start date. They preferred a later start date. Uh, another theme was concerns about alignment with uh, Prince William County's calendar and people's child care needs. And you can see how that represents 6% of the comments and 1% of uh, the approving um, group and 14% of the disapproving group. Yeah, it's bothering us. That must be pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> the music next we're not. We wouldn't let you go, but it was just bugging us too much. <laughs> this move to action. <laughs> <coughs> Tried not to talk too much today. Um, and then winter break, uh, people, you know, like their two weeks off. And you can see how it broke across the two categories. The community survey results show uh, we had four, 435 responses. 74% approved of the calendar overall. And you can see it uh, breaks up between parents, student, community members. Of those 435, we had 155 uh, comments. 45% um, of those comments addressed prefer largest, uh, later start date. But you can see uh, a majority of those comments came from people who didn't approve of the calendar. Uh, and then again, the spring break theme came out in this uh, group too. And the parent-teacher conferences, how they uh, wanted a day uh, one of the parent conference days in the fall to be a student holiday, um, and then winter break. So I'm going to switch over. So the committee met on uh, April 30th. Oop, that's all right. Oop, okay. Oh, you driving? No, I, I just want to close this. And you, hang on. Give me one second. Okay. So you don't screw up again. <laughs> okay, there we go. So I want to pull open the calendar now. Oh, you didn't bring. 
Oh, okay, it was there earlier. It's okay. I brought copies this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just give them all to me. Yeah. We'll, we'll pass them down. We've been in school this morning. Yeah. I think, yeah. So if you look at the calendar, and if you look real closely at the one I have on the screen, um, I circled the three changes. You know, looking at that theme analysis, the committee felt strongly to try to respond to at least the spring break, wanting the Monday after spring break, break off. So we looked at what do we need to do to make that happen. We needed to find an instructional, an additional instructional day for the student, an additional work day for the teacher. If we turned April 5th, that Monday, back into a student teacher holiday. So the committee looked at that. To make that happen, on May 27th, the original proposed calendar, May 27th was the last day for students, and May 28th was a work day for teachers. To make this happen, the committee changed that uh, that last day for students to May 28th, and made May 28th the last day for both teachers and students. Now, both those last two days are early release days, so the teachers still have some time to get their, their final um, administrative tasks completed. But we still needed to find one more teacher day in the calendar to, to allow April 5th to uh, exist as a holiday. So looking at August, in the original proposed calendar, August 4th was the start day for teachers. The committee discussed this, you know, there isn't much difference between starting on Tuesday or a Monday. So the committee is putting forth today a revised start date to the proposed calendar um, as August 3rd. As an anecdotal note, I did share this with the, supervis or the superintendent's ad um, advisory committee, which is, consists of teachers and staff across the division. And anecdotally, it was very well received. Mm -hmm. I think I heard a few comments of thank you um, for getting that Monday back on the proposed calendar. So with that, before I, I turn it over to you, um, one thing we added to the present let me make this longer. We added to the presentation this year is some FAQs. You know, in the comments, a lot of people ask, ask the same questions. And the first uh, question dealt with, and why do teachers have to report so many days in August? And I go into the math here, but basically, in the calendar, we, we assign 193 days for teachers to work. 180 of those days are instructional. The students are there. So that leaves about a 13-day, it leaves us with 13 days to account for somewhere in the, in the calendar. Now, one thing the committee felt strongly about is protecting June and July as summer break weeks for teachers during our, since we're transitioning to an earlier start. We want to protect those two months for their, for their personal time. So we try to ensure this, that the year ends the last day in May. In order to make that happen and keep intact the, the holidays that people have become accustomed to, Veterans Day, President's Day, the Monday of spring break, you know, give or take eight to 10 days on winter break, the only place to put them is at the first month before students start. Uh, and that's the answer to that question. The next question, what are the benefits of starting before Labor Day and ending in May? Yeah, this was a great question. I can't tell you how many times this, uh, I've heard this from people. And there are a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons that, that all students benefit from is that they don't have to reboot now after coming back from two weeks off after winter break and have to gear up for tests and so forth at the, for the end of that second quarter. By ending the quarter in December, students close out that first semester, go on their break, come back in January ready to start with new content and a new semester. So that benefits all students. The next benefit um, is that now high school students have a first semester and a GPA that's completed and can start to use uh, when they're applying for colleges um, earlier in the spring. AP testing benefits. It now levels the playing field for our AP students so uh, they have an, an more equity uh, in their um, instructional time and compared to their national peers. Same could go for the SAT and ACT. Um, and historically, all of our code blue days, our snow days, typically happen in January, February, sometimes into March. Uh, and so we lose instructional time in the second semester. By having more days in the second semester, we build in a margin 
and a buffer for that loss of structural time due to weather that we typically experience uh, later in the year versus the fall semester. Um, the next question, how will, this, uh, how will MCPS make this calendar work for students who participate in educational programs in Prince William County? You know, our coordinators of those programs work very closely to ensure students um, are, are ready for those programs. So in the beginning of the year, there will be an interim moment between our state start date and those programs. And you know, Mrs. Hart and the other coordinators work closely to make sure the students are getting a, kind of a jump start on their content before they start over at the governor's school and nurses programs in the RTC. Excuse me. And the ending uh, dates for those programs are all typically, they all typically finish at the end of May anyway. So the end date typically is not a problem. Another question I, I receive is, you know, can we consolidate two early release days and, and get one extra student holiday or teacher holiday in the calendar? The answer is no. The early release days count as full instructional days in our 180 day count. So they're really not days off or partial days off. So they, we can't add them to get one full day. And then, of course, the last question, I answered this already from the first slide, but why is Friday before Labor Day a division close holiday? It's because of the new law, and we're starting before Labor Day. So with that, I close my presentation and uh, ask you to take action on the presenting here. Thanks. May I have a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I move that the School Board of the City of Manassas approve the revised proposed 2020-2021 school calendar as presented. Second. Motion by Mr. O'Hanlon, second by Ms. Seberg of the School Board of the City of Manassas approved the revised proposed 2020-2021 school calendar as presented. Is there any discussion? Mr. DeMaria. Um, here we go again. Um, the 19, the 2019-2020 calendar, the one we're about to go into. 1920, yeah. The new teachers start the first week of August, do they not? Yes, August 1st. Okay, and I was against that. Um, and now we're moving it up into July now. So we're even going any further. The um, balanced schedule so that they are, each semester is the same, you know, or you finish it at Christmas, mm -hmm. at winter break. Um, I count 12 days difference. And I understand that most of our days off weather related are in the second semester. I don't think there's 12 days more. So I think we're still gonna be unbalanced that way. Um, and as long as I was against 2019, 2020, starting as early as it is, I'm gonna vote against this one too. And I want you to know I appreciate all of your work and I appreciate the committees, all of their work. Um, I just don't agree with it, okay? I still love you. <laughs> Not personal. Sorry. Come here. All right, well, there's no discussion. Well, the motion is um, Mr. O'Hanlon, the school board of the city of Manassas, approved the revised, with second by Ms. Seberg, approved the revised proposed 2021 school calendar as presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. The ayes have it four to one. Thank you. And with that, we've reached the end of our agenda. Move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> we don't want to leave. We're having too much fun. <laughs> Motion by Mr. DeMaria, second Mr. O'Hanlon, that school board adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We are adjourned 5-0. <laughs>